to have all of you here this morning. Uh, it's good to be here in the heat of summer. A little bit of a reprieve today, I guess. This morning, I want to continue our series in 2 John. We're going to look at two verses this week. Last week, we looked at 2 John verse 4, and we talked about a command for truth. Now we're going to move to 2 John 5 and 6, verses 5 and 6, and a commandment for love. The second commandment that John gives us here. So 2 John, verses 5 and 6 read, Now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you are to walk in it. Father, I thank you this morning for your word. I pray that you would bless and anoint it, that it would go forth in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let us speak to our hearts and our spirits today, Lord, and we give you praise and thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So last week, the Apostle John presented us with the commandment to walk in God's love. Our truth, I'm sorry, verse 4. As some of the children of the chosen lady had continued to do, as he made mention of that. Their continued walking in truth resulted in bringing joy to the apostle. He was, he was joyful that some had remained in the truth. He talked about that, how some will remain and some do not in the truth. This week, however, John continues to set a standard that I think is important for all of us. And this second standard is, 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 the standard is a second commandment, one which is not new to the chosen lady and is not new to us. If there's one thing we can say about John and his gospel and his writings, his epistles, is that love is a very integral part of what he writes and what he believes. He is often referred to as the disciple whom Jesus loved. You know, they were just, the intimacy, the closeness between the two of them was so great that he was like the apostle. Um, not that necessarily there was a ranking, but even to the point that on the cross, Jesus looks to John and tasks him with taking care of Mary because Jesus was dying on the cross, which I think is quite interesting when you consider the fact that there were other siblings of Jesus. As we know that because the book of James was written by Jesus' half brother. Uh, and, and I believe Jude as well. So we do see here that there are other family members, but it's tasked with John. And John takes that task because of this, the, the, the friendship that exists. And um, we say in the Gospels, and it, it says here, that, you know, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And we want to talk about that love, uh, especially today in a world where the term love is something that is so corrupted. It's so twisted when we consider that. And yet, as we have done um, on Wednesday nights in Colossians, we've talked about this particular word, this Greek word for love. Uh, we looked at some different ones recently uh, and all of this, but the one word we want to look at is the Christian standard for love. Um, it's, this is a commandment that all who, uh, who receive Christ know from experience. When you accepted Jesus Christ as Savior, your response to him, accepting him as your Lord was a response to an extension of his love. That love was expressed, you experienced it. And let's be honest, any of us who have experienced any type of an expression of love from someone, there's something about that. It doesn't go unnoticed, right? When someone expresses love to you, there's a sense, there's a feeling there that you know that that expression has gone forth. And the same is true when Jesus expresses his love through us through the working of the Holy Spirit, that we receive Christ and we experience that expression of love. It's, it, it is... Um, for God's deep expression to us at salvation, God expresses this. It, and when we receive Christ as Savior, when we respond to that love, then it requires something of us because there's also not just a reception of love, but a commandment for love. When we receive Christ and we accept that Christ as Savior, then we also have a command that we are to follow. And this is what I want to look at this morning in John, uh, John, you know, Second John four or five and six. This command. So I'm going to look at three things this morning. I've got some other scripture passages to go with this, and I believe they're all from John's writings. Because let's be honest, John just you know he nails this whole idea of Christian love. He really does. And so when we talk about love, the first thing that we need to look at is the idea or the concept of what I would like to refer to as mutual experience. 
Love is mutual experience. 1 John 5, 1. Remember 1 John? That was a while back, wasn't it? 1 John 5, 1 says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves the child born of God. This, set, this idea of a mutual experience that exists between us and Christ. When, we, when you accept Jesus as Savior and you're born of God, then the love of the Father is in you. You experience that. And of course, by experiencing that, you express that back as well. You know, it's, it's, there's nothing worse, I think, maybe there's other things worse, but for me, there's something difficult about the idea of an unreciprocated love, a love that's expressed and not returned. And while that's difficult for us, imagine our Heavenly Father who, who gave the greatest sacrifice of all His Son, Jesus Christ whose expression of love was greater than any expression we can even think of or imagine. And, and to give that expression of love and not have love return is something that is just I mean, it, it must break the Father's heart not to have that, that reciprocated, not to have that return. And it says, if you love the Father, um, anyone who loves the Father loves the child born of him. So that's Christ. Let's think about it for a minute. Aren't we all born of God? Aren't we all children of God? Shouldn't that expression go beyond just our relationship with God Himself to include others? Um, I might be stretching a little bit here, whether John was intentional or not, but in my, in my opinion, in my mind, I think it, it goes beyond just feeding myself and fattening my spiritual life on the love of God without expressing something in return. And, with, and you say, well, I love God, and I, I pray, and I, you know, I express my love for God. Uh, and yet, at the same time, we live in a world where, where even believers are not expressing the love of God to others, whether in the church or outside the church. So we need to realize something here. The two points that we have here is, first of all, God is not only to be received, God's love is not only to be received, it's to be given back. You know, you just take it in. you got to give it back in return. And, and so it's, you know, and it's not like, well, is that selfish on God's part that he requires of me to give him back something? Um, and that's not it at all. What it means for us is that um, if you have expressed that love and that love of God is in you, and I'm going to get to that point over here in a few minutes, if that love of God is in you, then you've got to do something with it. Um, I used, uh, when I was a youth pastor once, I used an illustration about receiving things from God, but with, with the young people, what I did is I had a bowl, a big bowl, and I had a big sponge, one of those car wash type sponges, okay? And I took a pitcher of water and I poured it into the bowl, and I didn't want to do it here because I ended up splashing all over the place. I poured it into the bowl and it just kept running into the sponge, and it, you know, it bounced off the sponge, went into the bowl, but the sponge continued to saturate and soak up the water. Now, the sponge will only hold so much. So eventually I had to pick up the sponge and wring it out into another bowl before I could get it to pick up and saturate itself and bring in more. And I think that's how God's love is. We can get so fat and so, so saturated with God's love. But you know what? God says, I want you to wring yourself out. I want you to take that love and I want you to express that to others. You need to get out of my bowl and go into the other bowl and express that love over here so you can come back and get more of mine. You see what I'm saying? And yet we sit around and think, you know, God is love, God is love, who like all that stuff. You know, this mutual admiration and love for one another. And yet the goal is to take it out of this bowl here, which we'll call the church or the body of Christ, and let's take it into this bigger bowl, which is the world. If I, if I can continue to pour water into this bowl, if I don't eventually keep doing this, I cannot fill the world with God's love that outpouring, that overflowing of the love of God that the world needs. And so we must realize that it needs to be given back, and not just to him, but to everyone, without exception. And let's be honest, we live in a world today where the expression of love unconditionally to anyone without exception is a foreign idea. Now, there's some who may take admirable efforts to try to do so, but again, as I've said in the past, love that is not expressed as God's love becomes self-serving. Okay? So the believer cannot profess receiving the love of Jesus Christ and not return it to others in kind. You can say, well, I love, Je I love Jesus, Jesus loves me, and that's good enough. But if you don't take that and express it, and I've seen 
individuals who are a part of the body of Christ who are who say they love God, they love Jesus Christ, and they condemn everything, which is which goes totally against the love and the will of the Father. It, you know, condemnation is not ours to do. Ours is to express love. It's to bring others into the body of Christ by expressing that love. So you can profess it all you want, but you've got to give it back in kind. It must be returned. And if you're not returning the love of God, there's a problem. And really that gets me to think, and I I'm kind of my mind does this, and I can jump ahead here, and I don't want to do that. So it gets me to think about something I will tell you in a minute. But I'm not going to tell you right now, because then that would ruin the next point. Or the point after. Won't ruin it, but gives it away. You know, it's kind of like watching previews for a movie where they show you all the good parts, and then you go and watch the movie and you say, I could have just watched the preview, because everything else was filler. Right? Yeah. So anyway, moving on to the next point then. Not only is love to be a mutual experience, it's commanded. Love is commanded. And this to me is very important. I hope it's important to you as well. John 15, 12 puts it this way. This is my commandment. That you love one another just as I have loved you. Now, let's think about this for a minute. This is my commandment that you love one another. And again, this is one of those things within the body of Christ that we say, well, I love my brother and my sister in the Lord. I love them. And yet outside the, the body of Christ, that love is, is foreign. It's, it's strenuous. It's strained. It's it's, it's not clearly expressed. And yet he says, just as I have loved you. And again, maybe I'm going to run a little loose with this, but here's my thought on this. This is my commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. Christ did not die for Christians. This is love, love was expressed for all humanity throughout history, without exception. So when he says, just as I have loved you, he's not talking about that super saint that sits in the second row Nobody in the second row today would know that. Okay, no, super saint that sits in the second row and says how holy they are and expresses their holiness. What it means is for every man, woman, child, anyone, whether they've accepted Jesus Christ as Savior or not, God expressed his love for them by sacrificing his son on the cross. He says, just as I have loved you, there are no exceptions. This is the command. As Christ loved us, and gave this life for us, so we are commanded to give our life and love to others. Now, that life is not necessarily a sacrificial giving up of the physical life, as Christ did on the cross. But there's something to be said about sac the sacrifice of ourselves for the care and the love expressed to others. And this is what we are called to do. We are commanded to do so. Again, this is my commandment. That you love one another. Not just in the church. I mean, it's tough to think about this. If, if in the world we all understood this from a godly perspective, how much better things would be? If we were to experience it mutually between one another, if we understood the commandment to, to express it back and forth and share with one another, things may not be perfect because there's always going to be those that won't do it, but that things can improve drastically. And as a body of believers, as a church, we cannot separate ourselves from the world and the expression of the love that we have for that Christ's love for others. We can't do it. You see, the believer cannot live to experience Christ's love without honoring his command to return that love to others. So how can I, as a believer, say that I've experienced the love of Christ, the true, unadulterated, perfect love of God, how can I say that I've experienced that and not return it to others when I am commanded to do so? So what does that mean? I have to ask myself a question. Do I really love Christ as much as I say I do? Think about that. Oh, yeah, I love Jesus. But your actions don't show it. So how can I say I love Jesus and not follow his command? This wasn't a suggestion. It's a commandment. It wasn't an option. We are commanded to do so without exception. So if you're not doing this, 
without hesitation, without, without you know, running yourself through a bunch of considerations as to whether you should or not, if you're not doing this the way Jesus commanded you, then maybe you have to question what my relationship with Jesus Christ is really all about. Am I just trying to keep myself out of heaven? Am I out of hell? Keep myself out of heaven. Keep myself out of hell. Or am I working to help others find him? Our motivation. Following that commandment. And this brings us to the third point that love is lived. Love is lived. 1 John 4, 7 says this. Beloved, let's love one another. For love is from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Why? For God is love. I didn't put that in there, but that's fair. For God is love. Right? Now what does that mean? God is love. I've shared this before when I talk about love. Love is not an action for God. It's an attribute. When it, it says, it, notice it says God is love, not God does love. God cannot exist outside of of love. It's something he has, an attribute of his that he has chosen to share with us. So God exists throughout eternity in a continual state of love. And he's asking us to get up in the morning and when our feet hit the floor, to live in a continual state of love. And when we put our head down at night, when it rests on the pillow, we have lived a life of love. Day in, day out, continually, as God is love. So we are called to be love and to love. You see, to be born of God and to know God is to live for Him. I cannot say that I am a believer in Jesus Christ and not commit my life to Jesus Christ. It doesn't work that way. I cannot say that I know God and not choose to live for God. Now there are people that, you know, again, there are people out there that say, well, I know God. You know of him. But do you know him? There's a difference between me having a converse, uh, me knowing of an individual, okay, and spending time, you know, uh, even studying that individual, you know, like, like for instance, there would be a huge difference between me knowing John, of John, who writes these, this, the gospel, who writes these epistles, who writes Revelation, okay? who writes these things, who has an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ, who walked with him, who ate with him, who saw the miracles, who did this. I know of John. But the only way I, know of, I, I can know him is through his letters. I've never sat down across the table from him and broke bread. There's a difference between knowing of him and knowing him. So the only way I can know him is through what he shared with me in his letters, so I don't have that personal experience. So to say that I know God, I know of God, is to say I, I believe in his existence. But to know him is to, for lack of a better term, break bread with him. It's to spend time in prayer with him, in conversational prayer, not just feeding everything to him that you want, but listening to what the Spirit says. All of it. So we do see this idea. The believer must learn to live each moment in the presence of God's love. It's a continual thing, moment after moment, day after day. It doesn't go away. It's always there. there are, are there times when we feel like we're not, you know, we, that we're missing God's love? Absolutely. <laughs> But it's not because God has chosen not to love us, but because we've chosen to miss out on that love. We're the ones that, have, that, that will separate ourselves from that. Not him. He's always there. His love is always expressed. So we must live each moment in the presence of God's love. So then what does all this mean for us? Okay? We are commanded to love one another. It's not open for discussion. Nor should it be. And I think that's important. I was, when I was putting this together and, um, <coughs> yesterday morning, I got up really early. I was kind of looking at the conclusion, and I had this we are commanded to love one another, it's not open for discussion. And I had it stop there, and I thought to myself, you know what? There's, I, I need a little add on here. It shouldn't be. You have, we have no right as believers in Jesus Christ to choose, to choose whom we should love. 
You can't have a discussion. Well, you don't know that person. You're opening that for a discussion. No, it doesn't matter because God knows that person. Christ knew that person when Christ died for her. That's not open for discussion. Let's not try to validate or invalidate those who should or should not be loved. It's not our call. So, the commands set forth in God's word are not mere suggestions left open for discussion or debate. And in, in our culture today, especially when it comes to things like the word of God and things like that, the idea of discussion or debate, you know, what we, it's left open. You know, it doesn't mean the same thing to me that it does to you. It should only mean one thing, what it means to God. It's not our call. Well, you know, I, I view love differently. If you, if you view love any other way than the way God has presented it, it's wrong. God is love. He has expressed that love unconditionally through Jesus Christ. He didn't just come to die for a select few. He came to die for all. And isn't it amazing that almost 2,000 years later that still holds true? John's repeated emphasis on the themes already addressed in his first letter. We talked about truth last week, love this week. These are very important themes. It's almost like we're just going back and looking at what he's already shared with us, but these are an indication of their importance to the apostle. Nothing can emphasize this importance more than the repeated focus on the topic of love. This is important to John. Why? Because in the church, in that church body, love was not being expressed. The, the, those that were working their way in began to do things that began to take away the emphasis, the impact of, of the love of Christ. Now, the Greek word that John uses here is very similar to the one that Paul uses. It's agapao, which is a form of the word of agape. But this is a verb. A verb indicating the need for those who love one another to take an active part in that relationship. So the agape love is, again, that unconditional love. It's without exception. It's a love that, that is significant, to, that, that is expressed uh, regardless. Not reciprocated love, not something that, um, like sorge, which is family, family love, love for a brother or sister or a sibling, not the play or the brotherly love. This is a different type of love. It is unconditional, without exception, we are called to love. When he says love one another, we cannot make distinctions. It is defined as this, to have a strong, non-sexual affection and love for a person and their good as understood by God's moral character. So, got that? A, a strong, non-sexual affection that has to do with, with, with intimacy that way, love for a person and their good, love for the person and their, their, their good as understood by God's moral character, especially characterized by a, by, a will, uh, by a forfeiture of rights or privileges on another person's behalf. So agape love says, I'm going to love you unconditionally it's a strong love. It's for a person and their best interest as understood by God's moral character characterized as a forfeiture of my will and my privileges on their behalf. That's tough. Think about that. That is that's very difficult. This is the command to love one another. It's a command that we can uh, can can all align with if we allow ourselves. It is a command which the world needs now more than ever. I think we could agree on that. It is an indication of the believer's love of God, love to God, and a life well lived. It's your life. It's my life. It's how we live from day to day. So the, this morning as we close, the question I have is this, do you love God? Isn't that our answer? Such a silly question. I love God. Do I love God? 
Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? And is that acceptance expressed through the love of others? It's not just about loving God. It's about loving others, right? What was the second greatest commandment? To love your neighbors as yourself. Love the Lord your God with everything. Body, soul, spirit, mind, all of it. Just unconditionally love God and unconditionally love others. To what extent are you sharing the love of God in the lives of others? The level of love you express in loving others is a strong indication of the level of love you have for God. Think about that. The, the amount of love I show others is a strong indication of just really how much I love God. And it, you know, God, he doesn't buy into the lip service because he knows our thoughts, he knows our hearts, he knows our motivations. Convince him, as, try to convince him as much as you want. You'll never be able to convince him of what isn't true. So, what's being expressed? How you express yourself to others is a strong indication of how you express yourself in relationship with God. Bow your heads. As we close our time this morning, we consider the words in this message. I, I just have to ask the question. How much do you love God? How much do you love God? And how much is that love expressed in the life of others? There are always going to be people who are going to be really hard to love. We all have them in our lives or have them in the past. And yet God's word, as John shows us here, says that that doesn't matter to God. You know what? I have found in my years that we, there are people like that in the church that God brings into my life, and there are people like that outside the church that God brings into my life. Yet it's not my call whether I should choose to love them or not. I'm called to love. We are called to love. Do you love? Are you fulfilling the command to love? As Christ loved you. Father, as we close our time together today, I thank you, Lord, for the privilege of sharing this word again, of spending time together looking at this idea of the love of God and what it means to be a believer, a, a man or woman in Jesus Christ who, who loves the Lord and now wants to take that love and express it in love for others, to share that love. Unconditionally, agape love, Lord, as you call us to do. If there are any here, Father, who the Holy Spirit is speaking to them, and you're telling them, you know what, and they're not expressing this love as I have intended or I, I desire. If there are any that are that you're working in their hearts and in their spirits, I pray, Lord, let the Holy Spirit break through. Speak to them. Show them, Father, uh, what they need to do to be lover of God and a lover of others. I pray you keep your hand upon us this week. Watch over us. Keep us safe. And I just ask you to continue the blessing upon this church and its families. Continue to bring others in, Lord, as we continue to seek to, to grow in you uh, spiritually and in our knowledge of the word. Help us to seek you, Father, in all things. And I just ask your blessing upon those here this morning and those that are here this online. Be with us all in Jesus' name. Amen. And God bless you. I pray that you have a really great week. As always, if you have, have a donation to the church, there's a basket up front here you can drop it in. Uh, you can also give online, and the sermons, the sermon will be online later today. Uh, hopefully, without it, it's been working pretty good the last few weeks. Share it with someone. You can do that through the website, Facebook, or YouTube. But share it with someone. Uh, how about this? Share it with someone you love. Right? God bless you all. Have a great week.